So I think we'll get started. Um, I'm, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today. Uh, we are fortunate enough to um, partner with the Breakfast Club uh, Distinguished Lecture Series and bring to you Dr. Rebecca Gundry from University, uh, University of uh, Nebraska Medical Center. She is a professor and interim chair in cellular integrative uh, physiology and director of their Center for Heart and Vascular Research and uh, assistant chief of basic and translational research in the division of cardiology. Uh, she has been at that institution for uh, three years, right before COVID. Uh, she uh, did her previous training at Marquette, George Washington, and then uh, PhD and some postdoctoral work with one of the experts in mass spec, Dr. Jenny Wan Eich at uh, John Hopkins. And she has been um, an independent investigator since 2010 when she joined the Medical College of Wisconsin as an assistant professor, rose the rank of associate professor in 2019. Uh, she's really a leader in uh, uh, technology development, especially in the area of uh, mass spec. And you'll see from her talk that her uh, organism of choice is human. And she'll, she'll, uh, she'll show us some of the techniques that uh, she's pioneered. She's been uh, she's a fellow of the American Heart Association, uh, funded from the uh, National Institute of Health, uh, and currently associate editor of uh, JMCC, which is uh, um, uh, one of the uh, premier journals in our field. And as most people probably know, the editorial uh, headquarters are here at University of Washington. She has more than 70 publications, some um, some in methodological papers, some describing biology in, in journals such as Stem Cell Report, JMCC, Nature Communication, American Journal of Physiology. And she's had a long-standing collaboration with clinicians and has worked with um, folks in the division, Dr. Claudia Smar and April Stempini Otero. So I'm honored to have her speak to us about her research. Thank you so much um, for the introduction. I'm really delighted to be here and see you all and see some of my um, long-standing colleagues. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about uh, some, some approaches to studying molecules that are in the human heart. That's gonna be the first part. And then I'm gonna tell you what we're doing at the division and the center level to help accelerate cardiovascular research at UNMC. So um, I don't have any particularly relevant disclosures. Um, and we'll, other than my perspective, um, we'll describe a lot of the, the approaches that we take and what we think about has directly stemmed for, from conversations that I've had with clinicians. So although I'm a basic science researcher and I have a PhD, um, everything that we do is driven by those conversations. So I encourage you, if you are a clinician, um, please engage with your research colleagues to help them along. And while my examples from the research side are focused on heart failure, um, the technologies are applicable to really anything. All right, so the learning objectives for your CME credit are um, to understand the value of molecular research studies and cardiovascular research, understanding some basic principles of how we do really efficient biobanking to enable studies of human heart tissue, and to understand the role of our um, kind of pilot program um, and how we use a research accelerator in a clinical division. So I'll start with the molecular research and really kind of the very basic principles of what drives the sorts of things that we do in the research laboratory are that we have a um, currently an insufficient understanding of what are the molecular components of the healthy and the failing human heart. And very simply, if we knew more, we could probably um, impact patient outcomes. So for example, from the restage heart failure study that outlines uh, different patient outcomes from LVAD support, um, we know that some patients can experience a myocardial remission to the point of the device can be explanted, uh, but unfortunately, none of the um, clinical factors that were examined could really predict which patients would benefit to the point where they could um, go into remission versus not. So this suggests that we need to understand more about how the heart uh, functions and what at the molecular level, um, how could we be able to predict a patient that will really respond. And in a report summarizing, discussions of heart failure treatments at an FDA facilitated meeting of clinicians and researchers, one of the major take home messages was that um, while current therapies for heart failure really target secondary effects like neural hormonal regulation and, and, and renal function, um, going forward, uh, therapies for heart failure really should be focused on the structural and molecular abnormalities associated with heart failure directly in the heart. 
And so very generally, we expect that if we had a better understanding of the molecules that were in the heart, that we could do lots of things with that information. We could perhaps evaluate the degree of biocardial remodeling in a person who has um, received an LVAD. Um, we could develop better therapies, better therapeutic targets, and identify ways to predict patient outcomes in lots of scenarios. So today I'm going to tell you about some new technologies that are helping us to address some of these unknowns about what are the molecules in the human heart. Uh, and like this quote from theoretical physicist Freeman Dyson that states new directions in science are launched by new tools much more often than by new concepts. And the effect of a concept-driven revolution is to explain old things in a new way, while the effect of a tool-driven revolution is to discover new things that have to be explained. And so in short, with new capabilities, new technologies, we can see and learn things um, about the human body, in particular the human heart, that we didn't know or we couldn't find with old approaches. Uh, and this sets us up to then ask new questions, and in our case, new questions about proteins that exist in the heart that we didn't know about before. So we can think of it like the Lumiere technology and what that did for revealing new knowledge about the Mona Lisa. Mona Lisa, more than 500 years old, but not until very recently did we discover that the Mona Lisa actually was created based on first a sketch, and that was transferred to canvas um, with charcoal, which now reveals the possibility that somewhere out there, there might be um, a pencil sketch of the Mona Lisa um, uh, from Leonardo. All right, so what do we know? Um, so we know a lot of things about the heart. We do know that the molecular and cellular events that occur during the development and progression of heart failure are really complex. So my entire research talk today is going to focus on one class of molecules, which are the proteins that sit at the surface of the cell. This is not to say that they are the only thing that are important, but they're one of the least well-studied and less well-understood molecular components of the human heart. So the uh, human heart has lots of different cell types that respond to insult and injury in a, in a cell type specific way. We know that um, within the failing heart, these are structural and compositional changes that cause stiffening and diminished uh, ventricular function, including things like cardiac fibrosis and cardio, uh, cardiomyocyte hypertrophy. And specifically, processes like cell surface um, or processes like cardiac fibrosis and cardiomyocyte hyper hypertrophy and cell loss involve proteins that sit at the surface of the cell. So proteins that are integral to the membrane, proteins that are in the extracellular matrix um, are involved in creating that, um, uh, that excessive extracellular matrix involved in fibrosis um, and that um, are involved in that abnormal calcium handling that we see. So, but at the moment or previous to our studies, we didn't really have a good idea of what proteins actually sit at the surface of the cell for the cells that are present in the adult human heart. And how do these change as a, as a cause or to contribute to, um, to heart failure. But based on what we know about the importance of cell surface proteins, we have an idea that if we could know what proteins sit at the surface of the cell and how they change, we could learn lots of things. Um, we could learn uh, more about disease insight because the proteins that sit at the surface of the cell, those are what control how a cell senses and responds to stress, to disease, to its microenvironment. We can identify new cell type specific uh, drug delivery, either drug targets or payload delivery targets. Um, we could use this information to develop reagents for research, like immunophenotyping and cell sorting. And also we could exploit cell surface proteins as biomarkers. And I'll give some examples later, uh, because cell surface proteins are often shed and cleaved, and then can be present in the circulation. So if you can find a protein that is specific or informative of your cell type, of your organ, or of your disease state, and it happens to be shed and cleaved, then it's much more um, tangible for you as a clinician to access that in the, in the clinical lab rather than having to take a biopsy. All right, so the, the, um, the lack of knowledge that we currently have about the, the, the proteins in the, the heart isn't because it's not important. Uh, it's not because there isn't interest. Um, it's because we haven't previously had the appropriate tools to be able to define these molecules. And so why has that been so challenging? Well, to start, you know that the heart is a complicated organ, has multiple regions, and the cells that are in these regions originate from different developmental precursors, and, they have, and the regions have different functions. Similar, the cells in, in the heart, each of these cells has, a, it has its own function. Um, and so what has happened, unfortunately, especially a lot in the, in the omics field and other sorts of things, um, if you've ever gone through and looked at databases or publications, commonly you'll see that manuscripts will just say, well, I took samples from the heart, um, which, and then just, this is generally my reaction when I see that because it's really not as informative um, as it needs to be. I'd like to know where exactly from the heart is it from, or God forbid you take the whole heart and homogenize it and then I really can't get any information out of it. All right, so um, besides that, the other um, technical challenge is why, um, uh, that relates to why don't we actually know the proteins that sit at the cell surface, despite the fact that there are hundreds of studies 
that use antibodies, transcriptomics, proteomics to study molecules in the heart. Um, why are these not good enough? Well, antibody screening, um, there are just not enough antibodies um, that exist that are really specific to cover all of the proteins that sit at the cell surface. Transcriptomics, this is great for measuring mRNA. And that's what it does. It doesn't tell you anything about proteins, doesn't tell you anything about protein abundance or where that protein sits. And generic proteomics um, will just tell you about protein abundance, but it doesn't tell you where the proteins localize. So altogether, these um, traditional approaches don't define the molecules that sit at the surface of the cell. Uh, so today, I'm just going to tell you really briefly about our journey to overcome some of these technical challenges, to develop a strategy to discover proteins that sit specifically at the surface of the cell in uh, human heart cells. And um, based on this, I want you hopefully to take home that there's a whole lot yet to learn about the molecules that are in the human heart. Um, and whenever possible, especially for cell surface proteins, you really need to have the experimental data because you can't predict the proteins that sit at the cell surface. And like anything else in research, details matter. All right. So to achieve our goal of knowing what proteins sit on different cell types in the adult human heart and eventually how do those change with failure, um, we had to develop kind of three um, key uh, technological components. One, a way to isolate human heart cells um, from heart tissue, uh, a technology to be able to allow us to map the proteins that sit at the surface of the cell, and then some bioinformatic tools to analyze the data. So to obtain the cells, we needed a method that we could start out with a chunk of myocardium that we get from the OR, either an LVAD implant or transplant, and take that and isolate cardiomyocytes in a way that keeps them intact so that we can rescue all of those cell surface proteins. And um, the challenges, as you can imagine, cells, the, the heart's a very dense tissue. The degree of fibrosis can depend on the DC state, which makes it really hard to dissociate those cells. Tissue access is rather limited. Um, if any of you work with rodent hearts, you know that you can hook your heart up to a Langendorf perfusion system and perfuse enzymes that allow you to associate those cells. You can't do that with a chunk of heart tissue from humans. Um, so we had to identify some other strategies. And then there's enzymes that um, are commonly used to treat tissue, to chop up proteins, to allow the cells to dissociate. A lot of those are trypsin or, or end kind of general proteases that will unfortunately cleave off all the proteins that we care about because that's their job, um, is to, to cut up all the, the cell surface proteins. And so um, it took us uh, several years, um, but now we have a really efficient method that we can start um, when we pick up um, tissues from transplant at like 7 a.m. Usually transplants are the night before, we pick up the tissue at 7 a.m. and we'll have isolated cardiomyocytes by noon. Uh, so um, if we do it fresh, but um, alternatively, we can do it in a, in a cryopreserved manner so that we can store up tissue um, to use at a later time and do lots of samples at once. So how it works um, very broadly is we start um, with, with tissue from the OR, we crowd preserve that, uh, and then we take that out of the freezer and then we slice it into 200 micron thick sections with a vibratome, then uh, digest that with um, collagenases. So we do sacrifice collagen, but the rest of the plasma membrane proteins remain intact. And then we use a technology called laminar flow wash, which allows us to wash away, um, wash away debris, immune cells, and, um, uh, and uh, end up with just cardiomyocytes without having to use centrifugation. So we're not adding. So if you've ever worked with cells in a laboratory and you've centrifuged them, you know that that causes a lot of stress to the cells and cardiomyocytes will start to swell when you, when you centrifuge them. So this method um, works really well. And like I said, we get a pretty good yield and it only takes us a few hours to do this. So now we can routinely do this from really any human heart tissue from failing or non-failing. All right. So then we had to have a method to allow us to, once we have these cells, how do we know, how do we find or identify the proteins that sit at the cell surface? And we had to do this in a way that allowed us to start with really small sample sizes because the, the chunks of tissue that we get can vary in size and we are usually quite limited. And we wanted something that's really highly specific for surface proteins. And so the, the end technology that we use is something called mass spectrometry. So this is an analytical tool. Um, you can think of it like a balance. So whereas you have your truck scale um, is scaled to measure the weight of a truck, a bathroom scale is measured, is weighted to, to measure, measure usually a person or perhaps an animal. Kitchen scale, smaller. A mass spectrometer is, a, is really a scale that measures molecules and atoms. Um, and with mass spectrometry, we can um, analyze the mass of molecules. And in doing that, we can identify something, say, what is it? We can characterize it and we can quantify it. And we can do all of this without having any antibodies, which is really great. Okay. So if you want to use mass spectrometry to look at surface proteins, the sample prep is the big part. You have to be able to enrich those cell surface proteins away from the, all the rest of the cellular content in order to be able to discover them. 
So um, to do that, we um, this is the only technical part of the, of the whole talk, I promise. Um, so to do that, we start with intact, in this case, human cardiac myocytes. And we exploit the fact that more than 90% of the proteins that sit at the surface of the cell are glycosylated. And so we um, use a, a biotin tag, which um, is a chemical tag, and we tag that sugar that sits on the extracellular domain of the cell surface protein. And then we can lyse the cell, chop the proteins up into pieces, and then fish out using that biotin handle. We can fish that out with streptavidin. So streptavidin biotin is a really tight interaction, allows us to fish out those biotinylated glycoproteins or glycopeptides, and then we can identify using that mass spectrometry approach. Um, and what this allows us to do is, again, without having any antibodies, we can start with cells and we can identify usually 300 to 700 proteins that sit at the surface of the cell. The number that we identify is completely dependent on cell type. Um, and not only do we get the identity of the protein, we also identify where is the protein glycosylated. And then from that, we can infer which part of the protein sits in the extracellular domain, because that's really important if you want to develop antibodies or drug targets in the future, you have to know how your protein is oriented in, in the transmembrane domain. And then we don't have to rely on any sorts of um, predictions or annotations to know that our proteins came from the cell surface. And while our old method, when this was originally developed, um, required 50 to 100 million cells, we've um, completely automated um, this workflow and done a lot of re-engineering and um, kind of redone some of the chemistry. And now we don't only need a few hundred thousand or a million cells. So this is well um, suited to when we get an apical core from an LVAD, we can take that and split it in, up into a few different types of, um, into a few different aliquots for different applications. And one of them is, is plenty um, for, for doing the cell surface capture analysis. All right. And then the last thing we needed were some bioinformatic tools. And I'm not going to go really into any of the details, but just to say that over the past five years, we've developed a number of different bioinformatic tools that allow us to really, um, uh, in a transparent and standardized way, process the data and really rapidly prioritize targets so that we don't have to spend weeks to months analyzing the data. Generally, as soon as the data um, are collected in the laboratory, using our tools within a couple of hours, we have a, a highly ranked prioritized list of candidates that help us distinguish, you know, failure versus non or disease, disease, other disease states or, you know, um, response to treatment, that sort of thing. All right. So combining the method, that cell surface capture method with our bioinformatics tools is what we call the cell super platform. And what this allows us to do is we can start with cells on one day and usually three, four days later, we'll have a prioritized list of targets. So um, this platform works for really any cell type from the human body. Um, but we originally developed it so that we could work with human heart cells. And so that's what I'm going to tell you about today. All right. Where's a clock? Okay. So um, and I'm going to tell you about um, us applying the cell server um, to primary human heart cells in a study that um, should come out um, in the, it's in the January issue. So it should come out in the next day or two online. So what we did was we isolated human cardiac myocytes um, and human cardiac fibroblasts. And then we obtained endothelial cells and smooth muscle cells just from a commercial vendor, but all primary. And we applied our cell server platform. And from that, we identified more than 1,100 proteins that sit at the surface of these cells. And so in this uh, database um, of 1,100 or so proteins, we have protein level evidence that these proteins exist. And we know what cell type we see them on. We have evidence of which part of the protein sits in the extracellular domain. We have the sites of glycosylation. And then we have experimental evidence that the protein is really localized to the cell surface. And I'll tell you a bit in a minute why that's really important. And we see lots of the things that you would expect to see on the surface of cardiac cells, receptors, transporters and channels, GPCRs, and lots and lots of drug targets. So these data are a really rich source for lots of different applications, but I'm just going to focus on a few of them today. And I'm going to start just by telling you why does it matter that we're so detailed in the type of experimental data that we generate? Why can't we just rely on databases that are out there and predictions and transcriptomics and that sort of thing? So when we use our veneer tool, um, we get a really highly curated output from our data that tells us not only, again, the identity, but the, the portion of the protein that sits in the extracellular domain. And so when we look at what has been known or, or, or described about either the heart or these proteins, we see that um, 30, for 30 of the proteins, we have experimental evidence that says that the transmembrane topology prediction, that's in Uniprot. So Uniprot is one of the central uh, databases that 
the whole world uses to understand or know information about proteins. So um, 30 of them are inconsistent with, the, with those database annotations. 66 are not previously predicted to be n glycoproteins, but now we have experimental evidence that they are. 358 are not annotated as being plasma membrane or secreted in another really large um, global human protein atlas that tells us which proteins are in which cell types. We have th 358, they're not consistent with that. 249 were not detected in. Um, there's a huge paper that came out a few years ago where they claim they did this unbiased, totally comprehensive proteomic analysis of the human heart. Um, and even in our kind of just preliminary studies, we already have proteins that, that were not discovered by that generic proteomic method. Also, even in our own um, studies of whole cardiomyocytes, where we didn't specifically enrich for solid surface proteins, we're finding proteins that weren't previously described. Um, 155 of these, at least in, from the cardiomyocytes, are not in the most recent, largest, biggest, latest, and greatest single cell, single nuclei RNA seq um, data set that exists for the human heart. It's because transcriptomics just can't predict the proteins that are actually present at the protein level. And then uh, four, more than 400 not predicted in a, in a, um, a data, uh, a bioinformatic prediction of the human serposome. So you don't have to obviously remember all those details. What I want you um, to, to realize is that if you're really interested in proteins, receptors, ion channels, whatever, that sit at the cell surface, you cannot accurately, accurately predict those based on either bioinformatics or transcriptomics. And you have to actually empirically measure them. And if you're going to empirically measure them, you can't just do a generic kind of proteomic analysis. You have to specifically enrich for them if you want to cover them. All right. So from these data, um, we have identified lots of lots of new things. Um, and I'm going to give you a couple of examples of them. And the first, I'm going to start with um, examples of proteins that we only either see in specific cell types in the heart or in specific regions of the heart, because those are potentially things that you could exploit eventually for delivering payloads to specific cell types or specific regions of the heart. All right, so um, here I'm showing what we call an upset plot. So it's just a bar graph version of a Venn diagram and it's better for showing overlap among things more than, more than three uh, groups. So um, how you read this is that this single dot means that 256 proteins were only identified in cardiac myocytes. Whereas this line up through all the dots means that 202 proteins were identified in all four cell types. Does that make sense? Okay, so from there, you can really quickly see, oh, for each cell type that we measured, there are some proteins that we only observed in a single cell type. And we always like to start out um, our analyses by seeing if is, is what we're seeing actually consistent with what's previously been described. And so we have, um, of the 256 cardiac myocyte proteins, um, CAC, NA1C, and SCN5A, so ion channels that we expect to only be in the myocyte, we only observed in the myocyte. We have ADORA2B and ECM1 that we've only identified in cardiac fibroblasts. Um, SCLE and IL13RA2 only identified in endothelial cells. And FRAS1 and JAM3 only identified in smooth muscle cells. So from that, I'm gonna show you one example a protein called LSMEM2 that we identified only in the cardiac myocytes. So this is a protein um, that gives a great example of why the experimental data are so critical. So the protein name is leucine-rich single-pass membrane protein 2. And this protein is one that we have, and we've done thousands and thousands of cell surface capture experiments across more than 100 human cell types at this point. And we've only ever seen this protein on primary human cardiac myocytes and stem cell-derived cardiac myocytes. Uh, and so when we went to look to see what's known about this protein, so we looked in PubMed, there's no articles about it, there's no known function, we can't find any reports that has previously been reported to be present in the heart, and it doesn't have a canonical signal peptide. So we go back to your days of biochemistry, hopefully you remember that a signal peptide is typically present in the amino acid sequence that helps shuttle the proteins to plasma membrane, but not every plasma membrane has a signal peptide, um, but that's typically used um, for predictions. And so in the Unipro, again, that big protein database, it's not predicted to be a protein that sits at the plasma membrane, and it's not predicted to be a glycoprotein. But we see LSMEM2 in cardiomyocytes that we actually isolate from any region of the heart, including the IBS, apex, ventricle, atrial, free wall. Um, so it's definitely there. And we see that if you put the amino acid sequence through kind of some of the common um, transmembrane prediction tools, they will all give you a different answer and probably because it doesn't have a canonical signal peptide. So this is probably why, even though we see it experimentally at the cell surface in the human heart, previously um, it hasn't been predicted to be there. 
All right, so um, when we started, there were no antibodies for this protein. So if you don't have an antibody, well, then you can't do things like imaging or cell sorting or other sorts of things. So um, we use our um, experimental data that we get from our cell surface capture experiment to inform, again, which part of the protein sits in the extracellular domain. And then we use that information to pick the epitope. So that's the, the part of the protein that we use to have the antibody uh, made. Uh, and so we, we picked that. And then now our new monoclonal antibodies are useful for imaging. So this is, these are um, images of human heart left ventricle tissue, but we get to see the similar staining pattern in all um, chambers of the heart. So we see that it's present only in cells that also stain for troponin. So that means it's only in the myocytes. We don't see it in the other non-myocyte cells as expected. It uh, overlaps similarly, but not 100% with um, known ion channels, KCNJ2 and SCN5A. And then we also see it in the intercalated disc as it co-localizes with connexin 43. So another um, uh, example of why uh, experimental data are really critical and that if any of you are doing research and you're using antibodies, I would uh, implore you to validate your antibodies, like really validate them. Don't believe the data sheet. Don't believe the publication. If you want to use it and your research depends on it, validate it yourself. So when we go to the human protein atlas, again, this really global resource that exists, if you look up this protein in there, it shows some immunocytochemistry data that they used, uh, that they um, generated using a polyclonal antibody. And they show that it's present in HeLa cells, Jerkat cells, and U2OS. So these are all just random cell lines that have nothing to do with the heart, which is weird because we and three other labs have used really sensitive mass spectrometry methods to study the cell surface proteins of each of these cell lines. And we have never once observed LSMEM2 on the surface of these cells. So we then took each of these cell lines and did flow cytometry, which is um, uh, and then another type of analytical method where you use an antibody and you bind that to, in this case, proteins that sit on the cell surface, and you can detect whether those proteins are present. In this case, using our monoclonal antibody, we do not see this protein on the cells. And then, because uh, it's possible that with an antibody approach, your ability to detect a protein can vary based on how the protein is folded, how um, it's modified, because maybe there's some modification of this protein in those cell lines that makes our antibody not recognize it. So totally possible that if we don't see it with an antibody, it's still there, just the antibody's not recognizing it. So for that reason, we use what we call a targeted mass spectrometry approach, where in short, we just tell the mass spectrometer, only look for the peptides from this protein. Don't look for anything else. It can do it really sensitively. And when we do that, we can see LSMM2 on our transfected cells on our primary human cardiomyocytes, but we do not see it in these other cell types. So this is just um, uh, an example of the need for continued vigilance when relying on um, predictions and antibody-based evidence for surface protein locations. All right. So in the end, ultimately, if after doing all of our uh, studies, if we had relied only on gene ontology or database annotations, we would have never selected LSMUM2 as a viable target. Um, so it's really the stringent criteria for classification as a surface protein, um, that is what helped us to not overlook uh, this protein of interest. So LSMEM2, what do we know about it? We have no idea if it's a drug target yet um, because its function is unknown. Um, cool things about it are that this is a protein you cannot study in your zebrafish model because it's only present in animals that emerged very late in evolution. So you have to have either a septated three-chamber heart, so a septated ventricle in a three-chambered heart or a four-chambered heart in order to express this protein. It's, it's present in the intercalated disc, and it's predicted to have a number of disordered and low-complexity regions, which altogether, in previous examples, um, can often correlate with the emergence of novel protein function in higher-order eukaryotes. So we've identified a new protein no one's ever seen before in the heart. We don't know what it does. Um, we don't know if it's a direct drug target, but it definitely has promise as a payload delivery target. So if you have to uh, deliver a therapeutic payload to a specific cell type, one of the most valuable things you can have is, you know, the, the mailing address, right? You don't want just the zip code that you want it to the heart. There may be a time where you want to deliver that payload directly to the myocyte. Um, and then more than that, maybe you want to deliver it not just the, to the left ventricle myocytes, but maybe you want to deliver it to the right ventricle because your left ventricle isn't affected. Um, and so we wanted to know if it's possible that our data could give us some potential region-restricted um, proteins that maybe um, future 
um, drug uh, therapy treatments um, could exploit. So again, why would we care about our region informative um, data? Well, we know there's functional distinctions among regions and in many uh, diseases, they can affect only specific regions in the heart. So maybe it would be advantageous to deliver your therapy only to the sick myocytes that are in the sick region of the heart, for example. Um, and then we have um, flacanide, which is a sodium channel blocker that can be used to treat atrial fibrillation, but can in some patients induce ventricular arrhythmias. So just kind of pie in the sky thinking, maybe if we could deliver some cell type and region specific um, you know, addresses, uh, maybe uh, drug companies or drug developers could exploit that to minimize unwanted side effects that, um, that are exerted on myocytes that are in healthy or unaffected regions. So can we get that type of information in our data? Perhaps. All of these um, require validation, but I'm showing you again the same upset plot. But in this case, the data, all I'm, all I'm showing are data only from cardiomyocytes isolated from five different regions of the heart. So both atria, both ventricle, and then the septum. And so we do see, uh, again, proteins that we expect in the pattern that we accept, expect. So SCN5A and CAC um, uh, uh, and A1C, we, own, we, we see in cardiomyocytes from all regions, whereas BMP10, we only see in myocytes isolated from the atria. So that tells us that probably some of these other ones that we're seeing in specific regions are also potentially will um, prove to really be region restricted. But again, all of those are yet to be validated. Okay. And then uh, my last example I'm going to show you is how could we use this approach to learn more about what's happening in heart failure to potentially identify, um, again, targets for drug delivery, um, and then pot uh, potentially remote sensing biomarkers. So for this study, um, it was a small pilot study where we had three non-failing hearts. So we took the left ventricle and we isolated myocytes from the left ventricle from three non-failing hearts collected from rapid autopsy and four um, failing hearts that were all non-ischemic cardiomyopathy collected at time of transplant. And we acquired our data in a quantitative way, which meant that we could compare the relative abundance of a protein in failing versus non-failing. And when we do that, um, we can see that in the end, the data cluster as expected, and you don't need to understand other, any of the details other than seeing that your non-failing cluster here and your failing cluster over here. And we see the same thing with the heat map that they, they separate out. So all that means is that just looking at the proteins that sit at the cell surface and how their abundance is different, that alone is enough to distinguish failing from non-failing. Okay, so what are some of the interesting examples in that? Um, and to do that, um, we exploited our, again, I didn't go into the, the details of our bioinformatic tool, but our surface genie tool is very simply designed to take all of your experimental data and rank order those proteins in order of the things that are most able to distinguish your two groups. And that two groups could be, you know, drug A versus drug B. It could be heart failure versus non. In this case, this, these are some examples of the proteins that are, um, have a high rank for being able to distinguish the two groups. And so the cool part is that we can start with what, the 490 proteins that we identified, and we do this in under a minute. So the data analysis is pretty fast to allow us um, to focus in on things of interest. All right, so what's known? Do we find anything known, find anything new? Um, so S1P, um, so sphingosine 1-phosphate receptor 3, is one that we found on the surface of cardiomyocytes, and its abundance on the surface of cardiomyocytes is decreased in the failing heart. Uh, and this is a protein that is known to protect the heart from ischemic reperfusion injury. We see SEMA4D and MFAT5, which are proteins that, to the best of our knowledge, we find that are, um, in some cases, associated with cardiovascular disease, but we're not able to yet find any previous really direct link um, of how these are really involved in cardiomyocyte physiology. And BST2 and ADGRD1 are proteins, again, that change that we have not been able to find any previous association with cardiomyocytes or heart failure. So we see things that make sense, and then we see a whole bunch of new things that we don't know anything about. Um, all right. And so how could we eventually use this information for biomarkers? So I imagine that most of you are probably familiar with kind of a classical biomarker discovery approach where you start with serum or plasma from your failing versus non or whatever group you want, and you do something. You apply an antibody base, an Illuminex, a mesoscale, you go to somalogic, you do something and you compare A versus B and you look for differences and then you hope that those differences really are informative for distinguishing your classes 
And maybe the things that change may or may not have anything to do with heart. All familiar with that? Okay. That is a very low hit rate um, because a lot of things that you'll find, tons of things change. Lots of things change just with inflammation uh, and age uh, and, and drug treatment. So can we find things that change and that are more connected to your pathology? And so this is where you can exploit cell surface proteins. So our approach to eventually developing remote sensing biomarkers is not strategy A, but strategy B, where we're interested in finding molecules that are in the human heart, so in various cell types in the human heart. And then we that gives us more you know, direct correlation that it's related to the pathophysiology of what's going on in the heart. And we know, again, that lots of cell surface proteins can be shed or cleaved. And some of that cleavage and that shedding can be specific to a disease state. So you can imagine if you have a cell surface protein that you know is either organ specific or cell type specific and or disease state specific, and it's shed or cleaved in a disease state specific manner. And then you're able to detect that in the blood. That's a much faster route to identifying a clinically useful measurement that is more directly connected to the physiology that's going on in your heart. And uh, to do this, um, we don't have, again, don't have to have antibodies. We can actually do this targeted quantitation. Once we know what we're looking for, we can do this targeted analysis, again, using mass spectrometry without any antibodies. So could we potentially use the data that we have from the human heart to think about how we could use such an approach? So SEMA4D is one example. <clears throat> so this is a protein, again, that we see its abundance on the surface of failing cardiomyocytes is lower than it is on non-failing. Why would a protein have a lower abundance? It could be because it's not as transcribed as much. It could be it's transcribed just fine. It's just not localized to the cell surface as much. Or it could be present, transcribed, localized to the cell surface in the same way, but maybe in the failing, there's more cleavage of it. Make sense? All right. So we found this. We also know that um, there's a couple of studies already out there. I'm only showing data for one that shows that SEMA4D in serum increases with heart failure. So this could make sense. If it's being cleaved off the surface of a cardiomyocyte, more in failing, you would expect more of it to be in the serum. And so this has already been proposed as a model um, that uh, SEMA4D, at least in platelets, now this is not a, a heart-specific example, but there's been a previous um, model that uh, SEMA4D in platelets is being cleaved by ADAM17 in a disease-type specific manner. And the um, and what we know from our studies is that ADAM17, the enzyme that's supposed to do this, is definitely present in the, head, in the human heart. So it's possible. So it all um, has yet to be validated, but it's just an example of how you can go from doing your um, studies directly in human heart cells in your various pathologies and then potentially exploit that information um, uh, long-term um, for biomarkers. All right. And then um, one last example from the, the research side. Um, that new protein LSMEM2 is a protein we also see decreased in the failing heart. And I just want to show you this example because it really hits home why whole lysate analyses don't get you where you need to be and transcriptomics doesn't either. So it's a protein that we see from our cell surface capture method that is decreased in failing heart. And when we um, took whole tissue lysate and did PCR, we didn't see a difference. When we did targeted mass spectrometry where we just looked for the non-modified peptides from this protein, we also didn't see a change. But when we isolated the cells and then performed our targeted quant, then we see the difference again. So what this just reminds us of, if you're ever doing tissue analyses, the problem you have is that you can't control the composition of the heart chunk that you're using. So you can take the same one milligram aliquot from each chunk of heart, but as you have more or less macrophages, more or less myocytes, more or less extracellular matrix, that's going to that's gonna contribute differently to your overall protein content, which makes it really difficult to, to figure out the molecular um, readout. All right. So in summary, um, the cell surfer um, platform is a new enabling technology that allows us to, to look at the heart with a, a new level of molecular detail that you can't get by other methods. And so we, um, we can apply this to heart cells, get new views. We get lots of experimental data has lots of broad value, and now we have lots of resources. And so um, now we can even inform, for example, um, drug development for non-cardiac diseases. We have some information to help folks prioritize which drugs maybe to avoid because they're present in the human heart. 
Um, and so other cool thing is we're just getting started. We have lots of new proteins we don't know anything about. I'm gonna to talk to you about biobanking in just a second. So we now have access to lots of new samples. Um, and then we, um, we have other technologies that allow us to see other parts of these cell surface proteins, again, that I'm gonna talk about. But long, a long story short is that this is really just the first generation of these technologies. And we're already finding lots and lots of new things that haven't been previously described in the heart. So we can only imagine what else we're gonna to get to as we do more. Okay, and then of course, I only talked about one application for mass spectrometry. If you want to talk more about what else could you do with mass spectrometry, definitely I'm around for a few more hours, happy to tell you about that. All right, so in the, in the last few minutes, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we're, our approach to biobanking and the research accelerator. So you're all probably familiar with kind of the classic approach to biobanking where the investigator defines a question, you write your IRB, you figure out how to collect your samples, do all that, it's pretty laborious. That's awesome if you're doing a big clinical trial and you know you're gonna have lots of participants. Um, in the other case where you have samples that are very limited, um, we just biobank everything that we think is gonna be useful for somebody at some point in the future. Um, and so our biobank supports both approaches um, and not just the collection process, but one of the things that we do to really enable research are that we have a streamlined process for IRB and consenting such that any investigator in the cardiac vascular space that wants to do research does not have to go and start their IRB all by themselves. All they do is come to us, tell us what sort of study they want to do, and um, then we determine, do we already have a blanket IRB that covers all of that? And 99% of the time we do. So the investigator just gets added to our blanket IRB, or maybe there's a the few little um, um, expedited reviews that have to happen, um, but we basically take away that administrative burden. And so for tissue collection, um, the one step we do need the provider to do after we've set up the study is that the provider has to gain ethical access, which just means that somebody in the provider, staff could be VAD coordinator, nurse, whatever, um, just ask the patient, would you be willing to talk to the biobank team? That's all they need to do. And once they say yes, um, that triggers the bat phone and then our biobank takes care of everything else. We do all the consenting, all the biobanking, and then we have the samples ready for the investigator. And we have super detailed SOPs to make this happen. Um, tissue collection in the operating room, how does this happen? Well, for lots of different downstream analyses, whether you wanna look at tissues imaging, you wanna do proteomics, transcriptomics, cell isolation, you have to think about from the very beginning, once the, donor, once the tissue comes out of the donor, how is it handled? Because if it's not handled correctly, you will eliminate your ability to do all those downstream sorts of analyses. So what we do, I'll just get right to the picture. What we do is we have cardioplegia that we make in house. Um, already is always ready in the cold room. And when we get um, notification that a VAD is happening or a transplant is happening, a member of my team takes down a, a one liter bottle um, as well as a bunch of pre-filled um, uh, specimen cups. And what happens is when um, for a transplant, when the uh, diseased heart is removed um, from the patient, it goes into an ice cream bucket that's filled with this one liter cardioplegia. And so it's protected for the couple of hours while they put the new heart in, surgeon closes, and then, um, once the, the, the patient is on its way to recovery, then um, the surgeon and the PA get together and dissect out all the pieces of the heart that we need. Um, and we then bring it back to the lab and either cryopreserve it so that we can do those cell isolations, or we put it in a variety of other things like RNA later OCT, um, and then uh, we store them for future use. And so this is just um, samples now collected over the past year with this new workflow. We are collecting um, lots of, um, bang along the side here, bottom, our LV, RV, LA, RA, IVS, APEX, basically as many regions of the heart as we can get um, from the, the transplant, the explanted heart, from the donor heart, we collect whatever the whatever's trimmed, and then for every LVAD, we collect the apical core. And so now we're generating a critical mass of samples where for one donor, we have all the regions. So you can start to, if you have a person with ischemic cardiomyopathy and the LV is diseased, we have their RV as a control um, because that should be less affected. And then we also have um, uh, samples from rapid autopsy that are um, non-cardiac disease. Okay. And then uh, for the role of the research accelerator, I'll just spend a couple minutes on this. Um, this is a new program that we started at UNMC in the last year. I don't have outcomes yet because it's too early, but I'll tell you what we did. So I meet with lots and lots and lots of clinician scientists and lots of people are really smart, have really great ideas. Some of them may have research experience, some of them may not. And they come and they say they wanna do research. I'm like, great, what can you do? Well, I can do PCR. Okay, what else can you do? Where's your lab bench? What tools do you have? Do you have centrifuge? Do you have pipettes? 
how much protected time do you really have or do you just have fake protected time? Um, and these are really fundamental basic things that happen in every institution I've been at, I've visited, I've talked to. And so what we decided to do is one of the, the best things we can do is at least get them a really good set of hands. Because if you don't have really good people in your laboratory, you can have all your great ideas you want. You can have all the tools you want. If you can't get those data generated, you can't get your papers and you can't get your, your K awards or your, your R1. So what we did to, um, to, to uh, um, counter that is we have a research accelerator. So long story short, research accelerator is a super duper experienced research scientist um, that the division pays for. So the division pays 100% of this person's salary and their job is to help brand new clinician scientists or people who are just starting the lab. They don't have to be an assistant, not always an assistant professor, but um, a, a scientist who wants to do research who doesn't have lab space or maybe doesn't have all the experience that they need. Their job is to just get their lab going. And so there's lots of defined duty. So it's everything from setting up the lab, setting up the lab notebook, figuring out how to do all the, if there's, you know, buy banking that needs to happen. Um, basically everything that you would need to run a research laboratory, this person is in charge of so that the clinician, when they only have half an hour every two weeks, can check in with this person and their research is ongoing, even if they can't directly monitor it necessarily because I monitor that person. So they are seated in a laboratory next to mine. So I provide big oversight, whereas, and, but I stay out of the way of the researcher. So the, the clinician scientist has direct oversight on a, on a daily basis. So, and then obviously you don't need all the details, but again, there's defined expectations. So it's not just, you have this free technician. There are things that come with that. You have to meet with them. You have to talk to them. You have to apply for grants. You have to write papers, all these sorts of things. We have um, uh, our expectations. So again, the division funds it. The person is placed in a laboratory next to mine. So they get lots of oversight. There's a whole laboratory full of equipment um, available to them. Um, and so this is kind of a sharing of resources. And by doing that, you get a really experienced person to get your lab launched and it's really low risk for the division because the, the division isn't investing hundreds of thousands of dollars in a startup package on a clinician scientist right away or for a clinician scientist who maybe doesn't have a strong research background and really needs the help, again, it's much more lower risk for the division to invest in this person that can accelerate the research. Um, and then the idea is that as the researcher then, hopefully in three years or so, has some sort of funding, then they can go on and hire their own um, research person. But this is, it's basically a shared, really experienced research person in a laboratory that's already fully equipped to do all the, a lot of the sorts of measurements that most clinician scientists wanna do. And so with that, um, I'll thank you for your time. Um, and for the invitation to come and for all the folks in my laboratory and our collaborators and also um, especially the surgical team. The only reason we're able to do the biobanking that we can is that Mike Moulton, who's the chief of CT surgery, is um, a researcher himself. And so I went to him and I was like, what are the chances that when you do a transplant that your surgeon and your PA would stay behind for a few minutes and dissect out 15 regions of the heart for me? And he was like, yep, yeah, no problem. So um, we are absolutely indebted uh, to the surgeons that, um, that did this for us. So thank you. Um, and I'd be happy to answer some questions. Excellent talk. Thank you for coming out to Seattle. Um, I have a question. So with some of those um, cardiac um, proteins that, that, that you were measuring, like like a SMMEM2. Um, what are the data that we have that they're not present in other parts of the body? Yeah, so that's a really great question. So I can't say that it's not present in any other human tissue at the moment. What I can say is when we go to any public repository, there's no, there's no data. We've looked through thousands of transcriptomic data sets. And my own lab, like I said, it has probably formed a couple thousand experiments on more than 100 different human cell types. We try to do primary whenever possible, and we've never seen it before. But it doesn't mean it's only there because we're limited to the, to the samples that we've actually analyzed. And we know that even if public repositories don't have detection of the protein by transcriptomics, it doesn't mean it's not there at the protein level because we have lots of examples of that. So we have some work to do on that. Um, but so far, we haven't seen it. Um, and again, that's a very different claim than saying, it's only in the heart. But so far within the heart, we only see it in the myocyte. All right, thank you. 
it looks like online Dr. Roth is asking um, this research accelerator, uh, how many clinician scientists can this person support at one time? So right now um, our accelerator is supporting two. We have um, one uh, heart failure clinician who is in his, just ended his first year of assistant professor who has really no bench research experience. So he is very high maintenance. Whereas we have another researcher who has a more um, advanced research program, really strong clinical research, just didn't have access to the, the tools and the equipment to do kind of the molecular and the cellular studies. So um, at this point, she's very busy doing that. And then she also, um, a third of her time, she also um, works in the um, bioassay core where we provide this cardiomyocyte isolation to other investigators kind of on a fee-for-service basis, but basically for the clinicians, it's free for now. So. Um, so, so, but our anticipation is somewhere between two and three to get, cause it's really, it's starting everything from scratch for these researchers, so. And um, I have a couple, maybe, uh, one sort of um, informa uh, informational question. How many samples have you now characterized? Like how many do you have the actual service program? Like people? Yeah, like oh. individual patients, I'm saying. Well, no, my question is really, do you have enough now with demographics that you can begin to sort of sort out, are there disease-specific surface markers yeah. or an impact depending on what medication right. they were on? Great question. So all of what I showed you today that just is coming out this week was the method development and the proof of concept application, which is, um, uh, I think, 20 to 25 patients in that. And again, it was four failing, three non-failing. So not a huge study. Um, because while we were spending those years to develop the technology, then we started all the biobanking. So right now we have 150 donors and we have more than 700 samples. So we're kind of just at the stage where we're ready to start doing all those comparisons. Um, I don't know. Yeah. And so anything from, you know, chamber specific or drug treatment, all those sorts of things are yet to come. But so far, um, I think, um, you know, the data from at least these small um, you know, kind of small end would indicate that for sure we're going to find differences among DC states. Um, I would imagine differences among, you know, drug treatments, um, that sort of thing. Um, my next question, should you get this often, how stable is the surface proteome? Like if you've got, gone back to a model like in uh, mice that you have more control of and saying like how does the delay between harvesting and freezing or processing or, you know, uh, the post-autopsy uh, samples change over time? Yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, for our failing versus non-failing, um, so the rapid autopsy, when we originally started, we had a lot bigger N than three, <laughs> but we were at some of the samples we had collected at our previous institution where we were not allowed to get the heart right away. The heart was forced to go to pathology first, sit on the bench for 48 to 72 hours before we could access it, which is why when I moved to UNMC, I did whatever I could to allow us to collect directly from the owner and it makes a big difference. Absolutely. So the collection time, and that's also why we provide, and previously we hadn't been able to deliver cardioplegia because we weren't allowed to do any, we weren't allowed to anywhere near the OR in my last institution. Here we put scrubs on, deliver the, the cooler to the OR and pick it up afterwards. So we can, we get, it's much, much faster. Um, so really great question. So if you really want to do good biobanking, um, you have to be consistent and as fast as possible because as soon as the heart comes out, things start to degrade. Yes, congratulations on this, on, on your work. Um, so, so I got a couple of questions. For the, the normalization issue, which you, which you um, pointed out is clearly an, an, an important one and you circumvent it a bit by, by um, normalizing to cells. But rather than tissue is my understanding. Yeah. So we take the, we, that's right. So we take the tissue, we dissociate and we start with isolated cardiomyocytes, but we don't normalize to that. What we do is once we are done enriching out our proteins and then our peptides, we actually normalize everything to the same total peptide content before we acquire the data. And the total peptide content, is that going to be variable depending on the size of the cardiomyocytes? So the total peptide content that you're able to extract from a cardiomyocyte will depend on that. But then, 
So if myocytes were bigger or smaller, at the end of the day, we're going to put, let's say, 1,000 micrograms on the mass spectrometer. So as a caveat, remember everything that I've showed you, all of this mass spectrometry fancy stuff is just the discovery. It doesn't cover any of the validation, which comes later to help account for some of those things, and which is why we try to incorporate imaging on tissues, so kind of non-perturbed yeah. as much as possible, other approaches. So yeah, so we're, we're just at the start. Yeah, I think that's an important point. So what you've discovered is really tentative. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the other question I had is, you know, there are a lot of applications, and you focused on some of them, um, of this identification of cell-specific uh, surface molecules. And one of the applications you focused on was um, cell type specific delivery. So uh, it's an area I know a little bit about. Um, I guess the paradigm in that field is of success is the acyl glycoprotein receptor on the liver for yep. what, I mean, they're, they're trying to find the acyl glycoprotein receptor of other tissues and cells has not been real successful. So, so, so yes. what is it that you're going to need to find in order yeah. to ensure success here? Yeah, I think um, a lot of those um, approaches are generally based on transcript, which unfortunately just isn't going to tell you what's actually at the cell surface. So we have experimental data. Really, it's benefited by the more experimental data we have. So we have a better discriminating power of finding something that's really unique to one cell type when we have data for more other cell types. We're always looking for collaborations for non-cardiac cell types. It's just not what we study ourselves. So that's a really important point. And, um, and the other thing is you have to think about what's your payload delivery context? Do you need something that's, if it just gives you the zip code to the heart, is that enough? Maybe that is enough. Or do you really need the street address to get you to a fibroblast versus a myocyte? Or do you need even more than that? Do you need a region? Um, or do you just need it to make sure it gets to the heart? And maybe if it's in one or two others, but you have such a higher abundance in the heart and lower abundance and, and really minimal abundance in these others, maybe because a lot of drugs work that way, right? Very few drug targets are unique to one, one cell type, right? They exploit the fact that um, it's more abundant in one, and then you get not zero toxicity of other, other organs, but you get limited. So there's all sorts of things. Yeah, I guess that wasn't really clear. So um, in addition to being cell type specific, there's going to have to be some property that considers internal appearance. Oh, sure. And I think that's a separate thing. So that depends on your your payload delivery mechanism, right? So whether you're doing lentivirus or shRNA or um, uh, lipid mediated or whatever, depending on the payload you have and its delivery property, the address is only one element of it. You're exactly right. Um, but there's Tons of different, um, really cool strategies people are developing for for payload delivery. Uh, outstanding talk. I, I just wanted to follow up a little bit with what David is talking about. Maybe a different um, idea. So your cell surface markers can have a lot of uh, properties, and a lot of the, the time with cell signaling. Does do your assays um, help after you identify a cell first marker? What the downstream effects are? Can you comment on? Is the technology there where you can uh, already find out what the signaling, what the partners are, or to tell us something about the biology? So, this is really just an accounting. What I showed you today. So if you want to know what your molecule is binding to, there's completely different technologies that we use to figure out who it talks to, um, which is not anything that I covered today. The other part of that for the cell signaling is the sugar. So any of your ion channels, your HER channels, whatever, they don't function if they don't have the glycosylation at the right site with the right structure. That is a whole nother layer of complexity that we use a completely different technology, a totally different instrument to do, and I didn't talk about today, but really important. So from our perspective, um, uh, Kind of the molecular accounting is the first part. What's there? Then how is it decorated? Who does it talk to? Where is it? Right? So is it the intercalated disc or not? Because that can give you some indication of function in a myocyte, right? So very slowly, but you have to also remember that to do any of that, um, you have to have the heart cells, right? And so a lot of proteins we see are not necessarily also in other animal models. Um, so again, we, we stick with just the heart uh, from, the, from humans. Um, at least at this point, we might go to pig in the near future, but um, but really great question, just lots and lots of work to do. I think the hour is up. We, we want to thank you for your outstanding talk and very, uh, uh, really uh, inspiring work. Thank you very much. Thanks.